Hi everyone, Sam here. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a few short words of warning regarding the contents of this video. This will be a full spoilers discussion of Homestuck. I'm not going to be going over the plot in great detail, but I will be talking about concepts and events from the entire comic, including the endgame. Light spoilers regarding the Geth species from Mass Effect 2 are also included for some reason, so a timecode will be provided below if you'd like to skip that. The video component will contain graphics from the entire stretch of Homestuck, but it is merely complementary to the core discussion. If you're looking to cut down on spoilers, you can enjoy this as an audio-only experience. I believe that Homestuck can be enjoyed regardless of spoilers, but I just wanted to let you know that you have options. Finally, this video contains some instances of flashing lights and images by virtue of using Homestuck's graphics. The worst of these have been slowed down, but I would still recommend that any photosensitive viewers use caution. Once upon a time, many years ago, there began a webcomic called Homestuck. It was a bizarre and sprawling story, one that enraptured the internet and rose to unprecedented heights of popularity. This was all well and good, but so strange was the story that it invited its audience inside and allowed them to shape it. But was that really such a good idea? It was a good idea, very much so in fact. It made Homestuck one of the most fascinating things to exist in the digital era. A claim like that is easy to make, but difficult to prove. Even just talking about something like Homestuck is a difficult subject to broach. It's incredibly dense, infamously strange, and comes with its own special sort of notoriety. Homestuck is a webcomic, but it's also twice the length of the Bible, has ten official albums, and uses countless animations, games, tie-in comics, and social media accounts to tell its story. It's not exactly revolutionary to say that Homestuck transcends the medium of traditional webcomic. That all makes it a challenge to explore, so why? Why is this the property we're going all in on and spending an uncharacteristically expansive amount of time dissecting? Here's the deal. When I was a simple little 13-year-old, I was a huge Homestuck fan. I read the comic ravenously. I scrolled through Tumblr waiting for the moment that someone posted update. I listened to Rex Duodecim Angelus on my MP3 player, and I made candy-colored horns to dress up as my favorite troll. Homestuck was my gateway drug to cosplay and cons, something that's still a big part of my life, but now involves a lot more alcohol and corn. Point is, I was there for the peak years, the thrilling Wild West era of Homestuck mania. Grey body paint, Fago cupcakes, Broadway car cats. We were living the high life, awash in the warm glow of wacky, inane bull hockey. I was probably about 15 when my interest in Homestuck um, finally kicked the bucket, and at that point the story was deep in Act 6, Act something, and rolling through a series of long pauses. I never finished Homestuck, but at some point after the comic wrapped in 2016, I realized that eventually I was going to have to go back and finally cap off that experience. Call it destiny. I just knew that one day I was going to go back, even if at present I didn't want to. I decided I would wait until the buzz and backlash subsided. I would go back when Homestuck became less of a cursed property and began to settle into its place in the Museum of Internet History. So in spring of 2021, I felt the call. Around 4.13, the high holy day of Homestuck, I finished catching up on Dungeon Meshi and opened a new tab on my phone to read Homestuck, beginning to end. I wasn't really sure how I'd take it. This was something I'd liked as a tween, and those are undeniably dark years. I assumed my enjoyment of it would fall roughly along the lines of a few video essays I'd listened to. I'd enjoy the ride up to Cascade, where the comic would hit its peak and then decline further and further into disappointment. Oh boy, that's not what happened at all. Cut to a few days after 6.12, I'm curled up under my desk at work, tears running down my face as I read a log between Dave Petta and Jade. I leave work a few hours early because this isn't even the first time today that Homestuck has made me cry tears of pure, beautiful catharsis, and I just need to immerse myself until I reach the end. Suffice to say, Homestuck has made me feel a lot of things at a lot of different times. But how? What's so special about a silly webcomic with a bad reputation? Is it really that deep? I would say, yeah. In many ways, Homestuck is an unparalleled piece of fiction. It is a story that could only ever have been told through the medium of the internet. It gained its intrigue and depth from the ways that people interacted with it to such a degree that fandom and the internet became inextricable pieces of the narrative. Homestuck became more phenomenon than comic, and it sits now as a one-of-a-kind work. 
The entire point of this retrospective essay, retrospece, is to explore that phenomenon. So, as I launch into an abridged outline of Homestuck's plot now, I hope you can keep that little egg of knowledge close to your breast and trust that we're gonna nurture it until it hatches into a sublime little chicken by the end. So here we go, a faulty by nature attempt at a summary of Homestuck. Homestuck is a webcomic about four kids who play a video game called Suburb. This game causes the end of their world and has them working towards the ultimate goal of birthing a new universe, which they will become the gods of. Unfortunately, their game session goes very wrong for reasons both far beyond and intimately within their control, leading them to have to hard reset their universe so that four alternate world versions of themselves can play their own version of Suburb, which the original four kids will eventually arrive in and vitally contribute to. Along the way, the kids meet Trolls, an alien race responsible for the creation of the kids' universe through their own session of Suburb, but denied entry to by more of those session-breaking issues. The story takes place over myriad timelines and two iterations of two different universes, all of which collide and feed into one ultimate narrative. There is an omnipotent, undying time demon that threatens the fabric of reality and exerts control over the entire narrative. There are bubbles blown by Lovecraftian monsters where ghosts from every dead timeline frolic on the edges of existence. There's a truly uncomfortable amount of horses. And it all mixes together into a journey that is equal parts joyful, tragic, and poignant, containing deep character arcs and relationships, action and lore so fascinating and complex that people are still trying to unwind it to this day, and inane, wacky bullshit so incredibly stupid that it comes damn close to disqualifying the entire comic as art. But it is art nonetheless. It is a ride and a half, and I cannot recommend it more. The thing is, Homestuck is not a piece of media that you can just talk about alone. It, by nature, does not and cannot exist in a vacuum. So when I say we're gonna talk about Homestuck, what I really mean is we're gonna talk about Homestuck and everything surrounding it. Because as much as it's a story about a young man standing in his bedroom, it's also a story about the internet and stories and fandom. It's easy, of course, to exemplify this with the way the comic started, as a small, drawn adventure game where readers could submit action prompts to the writer in order to make the story progress. From the very beginning, Homestuck was a story built in part by its fans. And that's a trait that would persist through its entire lifespan. Homestuck, in its entirety, is a fan-fueled phenomenon that could only ever have been possible through the internet. And if you had any hopes of this video being less meandering than the comic itself, know that we have only just now come to the end of the introduction. Homestuck is sprawling. For all the merit it holds as a piece of art, to many it is too much of a hassle to be dealt with. The beginning, middle, and end of the story barely resemble each other, and new high concepts and systems are constantly introduced throughout the first half of the story. Oftentimes these systems are only vaguely explained and candid, despite their significance, and even the point and goals of the story and the actions therein are inscrutable for at least half of the run, if not longer, depending on what you consider to be the core of the narrative. Despite this, fans will attest that Homestuck manages to work. Gracefully so, some would add. In truth, reading Homestuck is like putting together a puzzle without knowing what the picture will be. The start feels empty. You have very little of the vast image you've been promised, and the sight of hundreds of pieces or thousands of pages still waiting in front of you is almost oppressive. The initial steps are hard, but as you make progress, an image is constructed before you, an answer that slowly, piece by piece and panel by panel, reveals itself. It doesn't work linearly from a single point, and at times one clump of the puzzle may seem entirely out of place, only to snugly slot into the wider picture far down the road. Homestuck is hard to understand along the same lines as most other media due to its unique existence and creation. It doesn't situate you by establishing a setting or genre. It gives no thesis or quest. It gives you a boy standing in his room and then challenges you to see his journey through, as blind as he is to what's in store. And despite all logic, it manages to work. So in line with this puzzle metaphor, it's best to start with the outermost pieces, to explore what anchors Homestuck, its most basic building blocks as well as the solid base that makes its precarious, winding story possible and stable against all odds. The author of the whole shebang, Andrew Hussey, once said that they consider Homestuck to be a conversation between fandom and author. 
And this is one of the many aspects that cements it as a piece of media that can only exist in the modern era, where creators are, for the first time, accessible in a meaningful way to the people that consume their creations. This aspect of its existence is vital to the work as a whole, and it's the core point we have to remember throughout this whole exploration. Homestuck as a comic was constantly shaped by the people who read it, not only in the minutia of things like character names and features, but also in the broader strokes of tone and narrative nature. The symbiotic relationship between Hussey and their readers sparked the genesis of evolution within the work, lifting it from a simple story ruled by a single hand and into a realm of community involvement. Like Skya progressing from board to cube to planet, Homestuck grew in complexity and awareness with and because of the input of its fans. Now, make no mistake, Hussey was always the maestro. They were the pilot of the ship, first and foremost, and the universe and story of Homestuck should be credited to them. But much like the characters within it, Homestuck itself seems to go through an arc across its lifespan. The steady increase of its scope and size are palpable, but even more striking is the shift in tone that occurs across the narrative. To read Homestuck is to witness the cultivation of empathy. But it's a bit too early to be concerning ourselves with the end of the comic, so let's get a little smaller and focus on a little earlier. We can't understand the destination without the journey. The earliest incarnation of the Homestuck fandom was made up of early 4chan users and similar formgoers, leading to a predominance of straight male programming nerds in the audience. And this goes to show just how much of an effect fans had on the content of the comic from the very beginning. What is 2009 Homestuck if not a story for programming nerds? The beginning of the comic could be described as an introductory course to basic data structures. A good chunk of the puzzles and humor present are derived from the fetch modi that the characters use, each based on... Uh, hold on. I'm a biologist and not a computer scientist. I'm just not really familiar with this stuff, but that's why teamwork makes the dream work. Let me just... Two hours later. Okay, the early fetch modi of Homestuck are all based on data structures systems by which information is stored and retrieved within a computer system. And hey, that's interesting, items being treated as information, as non-physical, as ideas. This section of the comic introduces the mechanical basis of the world while playing to its audience in a chicken-egg style. Does the Homestuck universe work like a computer because the audience was made of computer nerds? Or is the audience made of computer nerds because Homestuck's universe works like a computer? This question could probably be answered with a bit of digging, but it doesn't actually need to be. It's just here to show that the relationship between fandom and comic always existed. The Modi puzzles are the first point of focus in the text, and they were more than just challenges for those following the story when it was still a text-based adventure game. These systems are the foundation of the universe. By making the reader grapple with how various data structures function, we are in essence given a crash course in programming and, by extension, a crash course on the nature of Homestuck's universe. The computer stuff is fun, but it goes a bit beyond my area of expertise. If you want an amazing rundown of it, go check out Text Talks videos. Uh, they're linked below. To break it down into its simplest parts, Homestuck's universe functions through programs, ideas, and the places where they intersect. The world is an operating system, ideas are power, and the intersection of the two is code. Physical objects can be capsulogged and turned into strings of code communicated through and manipulated by technology. Fulfilling the parameters of a video game causes a new universe to be spawned. Even as the narrative becomes more complex, more based in emotion and action, this basis stays true and supports every turn of the story. This core logic is laid out for us in place of a traditional setting, as it fulfills a similar role, informing us of the bounds of the universe and how the characters will interact with it. Programming and code would never depart as the comic's central dogma, but Hussey and the original crowd they were catering to had their negative traits as well. It's no secret that Homestuck starts in a place of wry humor and edgy irreverence. The first quarter of the comic is sadly littered with homophobic, ableist, and misogynistic jokes, and the dialogue heavily features use of the R-slur. These are byproducts of the era of the internet that produced the comic, but that only explains them, it doesn't excuse them. They're an ugly stain on the story's history, and can make early Homestuck a difficult read. As time went on and the comic grew in popularity and consciousness, both of these tendencies were corrected, but never forgotten. As ugly as they are, they can introduce us to an aspect of Homestuck that keeps it cohesive, an intense attention to past details, and a constant use of callback that threads the comic together. Homestuck's early mindless vitriol is later recontextualized within canon, the culture that produces cruelty and irreverence 
becomes a product of the story's ultimate evil and big bad. The use of the Arsler drops off dramatically in the later half of the comic, only being used once by a character that represents the negative parts of fandom and internet culture. In turn, the gay jokes become a touchstone in Dave's journey to accepting his own bisexuality. The tone of the comic changes throughout its run, becoming nothing short of a queer feminist exploration of stories themselves. Throughout it all, Homestuck never abandons its basis and never forgets where it's been, choosing instead to learn from and reflect on its mistakes. If programming and ideas are the cement foundation upon which Homestuck rests, its tendency towards reflection and callback is the glue that binds the whole thing together. Even as it balloons to ridiculous sizes, it keeps a merciless track record of its own actions. The good and the bad. No detail is too small to brush off, no gag too flighty to be reused and deconstructed in the future. Sometimes an idea is reintroduced into the narrative as a joke, and other times ideas return as points of meditation and retrospection. Both extremes, and everything in between them, are used in an ultimately constructive way. Many items which are at first thought to be jokes become totems of incredible significance as the story unfolds, causing the audience to examine their movement throughout and effect on the narrative. Not only are readers rewarded for paying attention, but they are also led to reconsider past events again and again throughout the comic's run. It may very well be that at the time of some ideas' introductions, they truly were meant to be inconsequential. But if nothing else, Hussey is a master of drawing old ideas back into the limelight, seamlessly integrating them into the complex timelines and the greater narrative. This leads to some of the greatest and most mind-boggling plots in the comic, such as Lil' Cal's disorienting, yet logically watertight, journey across timeline and universe. It's hard to say how much of Lil' Cal's trek across space-time was known from the start, but there is no way in hell all of this was planned from panel one. The pervasive use of nonlinear storytelling in Homestuck is frankly awe-inspiring. It's something I certainly couldn't wrap my brain around as a child, and even today I need some help putting all of the pieces together. This is another place where Homestuck keeps meticulous track of itself. A linear timeline can be constructed of all the events in the story, despite their nonlinear presentation, and the places where future and past communicate with one another. It is nothing short of masterful in this regard. Never have I seen a work that plays with nonlinearity, time travel, and causality so much and so well. The pervasive rule of paradox space is that the characters are constantly shaping their own reality, influencing the future and past with their every action. This is the crux of the story, and it's something that much of the run is dedicated to exploring, whether through doomed timelines, jumps to the end of the universe, or canonical retcons. Homestuck is a ballet across vast stretches of existence, set to an orchestral arrangement that is constantly changing time signature. And it works! It shouldn't work, but it does, because it was somehow meticulously constructed despite its serialized, ever-evolving format. No matter what, when you roll all the details around in your mind, they track and follow internal logic. By this metric alone, I would consider it a masterpiece. This preoccupation with an exploration of time is something you could argue that Homestuck as a work begins to embody. If there's one thing it's known for, it's being long. Long, meandering, and even bloated. Even as a fan, I wouldn't shy away from calling it as I see it. Homestuck is busy and swollen. Despite the negativity inherent in that description, it manages to wring every last boon it can from this format. To many fans, the length and complexity of Homestuck is one of its biggest draws, and yet it can pose a real challenge for those attempting to read the comic for the first time. The excessive nature is especially no secret to its creator, who comments on it in book six of the physical print thusly, I think world building, and much of storytelling in general, involves grappling with issues of excess versus limitation. It's a binary that can be explored, and freely swinging between them can be revealing. There are a lot of theoretical binaries like this, such as meat versus candy, which I mentioned a book or two ago. But unlike the meat-candy binary, excess versus limitation isn't just some shit I made up using allegorical symbology which nobody understands and will require approximately 100 books to explain. This is an idea probably most people understand on some level. Homestuck as a whole probably reads as a massive exercise on the excess end of the spectrum, because there's a lot of it? Obviously. It sprawls due to its whimsical, freeform construction, which is just the nature of the beast it grew up to be. Thinking in terms of bad or good can be pretty uninformative when applied to either end of these media evaluation binaries. There are pros and cons to everything, various trade-offs and factors to balance. 
within storytelling excess, the cons are things can get kind of sloggy and unfocused, or develop other problems of that nature. The upsides are engendering a sense of hugeness, a story expanse that feels more lived in the more you read, and more material to obsess over and analyze, all things that many avid consumers of media are known to prize. You trade some good properties, the strengths of limitation, for other good properties, the boons of excess. Excess in Homestuck is regarded with nothing short of a loving embrace. Upon rereading the comic this past year with far more media experience under my belt, I was at first very critical with the constantly increasing scope of the narrative. I knew Lord English was the big bad going in, and his sheer lack of presence in the first act shone garishly. The build-up for Beck Noir was so solid and sweet, shoehorning in a new villain just felt foolhardy. It was clear to me that he hadn't been planned until a few acts into the story, and I found myself skeptical as I neared part 5. I even doubted the trolls, one of the most popular and my favorite part of the comic. There was a stretch of my reread where I became skeptical of Homestuck's ability to ever pull itself together. These choices struck me in the moment as poorly planned and dangerous, the first whiff of them putting me on edge and convincing me the entire story was bound to crumble underneath its own weight. And yet, as I allowed Homestuck to do its thing and unfurl even further, all the pieces fell comfortably into place and the story was better and more compelling for their addition. Once again, the trick lies in execution. Homestuck, despite its massive size, narrative complexity, and wild nature was penned with a steady hand. Authorial talent is of course a huge factor, but talent is an immaterial concept that does little to explain the why and how of Homestuck's success as a narrative. A large part of this is the firm basis we talked about earlier. Homestuck is a story that built its logic early on and then stuck to it. Front to back, the comic runs inside the schematic introduced early on in the exploration of Modi and other programming ideas. Even when part of the story is breaking these parameters, it's done in a way that still speaks to the initial premise. After all, we've already been primed to view this story as a sort of video game, so of course blowing into the cartridge would fix it. Further, every new bit of the universe that's added, be it Lord English or Alternia or the Alpha Kids, finds its root earlier in the comic. They're new pieces of the story born from old fixtures, and so they end up comfortably fitting into the wider puzzle. These are the broad strokes of Homestuck, the big guidelines of a big story. Quite evidently, they're not really the aspects that people tend to latch onto. As said in the author notes, Homestuck is not excess alone. But if you zoom in closer on Homestuck, you see the greater excess is cobbled together by many smaller bits and pieces, like arcs, vignettes, subgenre write-ups, and intriguing little foirés into these distinct world-building endeavors. And I think these smaller building blocks often do exhibit the stronger properties that arise from emphasis on limitation in storytelling. Which is why this stint with ancestral lore we're about to go on, while in a broader sense contributes to the bloat of Homestuck and adds to its overall profile of excess, at the local level I think uses the tactics of restraint and limitation effectively enough to make it something fascinating to think about which then begins tilting the argument in favor of its inclusion in the first place. This pattern appears to hold true for many such excessive-seeming inclusions, like the entire god-tier system involving classes and aspects. It constitutes a massive overall inflation of the story's lore footprint, but its presentation holds back, I think, just enough information to make it intriguing and worth theorizing about. If it told you everything, there'd be nothing to wonder about. But if it told you too little, you might not care enough to wonder at all. Restraint in the exploration of its ideas is a key feature of the work. It adds mystery and engages the reader, inviting them further in and daring them to try and make sense of it themselves. These small pieces are what grabs people's imagination, not only further investing them in the story, but also inspiring them to create on their own terms. This is what provokes scores of fix that flesh out the ancestors, pages upon pages of class-spec analysis, and enough headcanons to fill an encyclopedia. Homestuck is propped up first by its basis in programming, and it's held together by callback, but the particular style of mixing excess and limitation is what makes it so consuming. Like walking along a spiral, every interaction with the media draws you closer, raises more questions, and provides just enough answers to keep you going without giving away the game. Homestuck is a vast piece of media that thrives on ideas, making it a rich canvas to explore, and cultivating a sort of obsession in its audience. That deep passion it evoked in readers was what made Homestuck famous, and what let it spread like wildfire across the internet. There is something deeply addicting about Homestuck. 
That's no secret, seeing as how massively popular and all-encompassing the fandom was in its heyday. It has an incredible ability to inspire, moving countless fans to consider and create in its wake. The experience fans had with Homestuck was a core facet from the very beginning. It was always a conversation between fan, author, and work. At first, this relationship manifested simply as a command box where readers could control the characters within the narrative, but over time, Homestuck would grow to have a complex, symbiotic relationship with the people reading it, inheriting the ideas of the fandom into its DNA and growing based on the model they provided. Even from the very beginning, Homestuck was a collaborative project. The first S-Flash occurs on page 77 with John play a haunting piano refrain, and uses a piece written by Malcolm Brown. It's a short, simple flash, but within this page lies the glimmer of what Homestuck Homestuck would eventually become. Over the course of its run, Homestuck would retain a single author, but gain the backing of thousands of devoted fans, hundreds of which were willing to dedicate their time, effort, and crafts to the narrative, providing music, drawings, animation, and coding to the work. Each hand lifted Homestuck higher and higher, allowing it to supersede the comic format and become something anomalous and beautiful. Homestuck became a tapestry of myriad ideas and creations, even after the suggestion box had been closed. It's more than images, gifts, and an ungodly amount of text. By the end of the comic, Homestuck had used a total of 166 animations throughout its run, totaling over four hours of video. There were 19 unique Flash games to play, which, alongside the animations, were all backed by beautiful fan-composed music, the totality of which fills out 12 albums of pure aural decadence. In its latter half, the comic even uses social media, DeviantArt, Instagram, and Snapchat pages baked into the story and used by the characters. There's nothing else out there that even comes close to Homestuck's approach to medium and multiplicity. It's daring, it's a monolith, and it was only possible to create through the effort of the community. While webcomic is technically the correct way to categorize Homestuck, the term is altogether inadequate. Homestuck is a multimedia, multi-format explosion. It's something that could only ever exist on the internet, which is fitting considering the internet and internet culture were always such critical parts of the narrative. From the very beginning, the comic is centered around online friendship, and, as we discussed before, operating systems are the basis of Homestuck's universe. The niche it carved out for itself on the net feels almost like destiny. As Homestuck grew, its relationship with the internet became reciprocal, and it became an icon of the digital. In the perfectly generic podcast's 46th episode, Dave of Guy, Homestuck's long-lasting effect on the language of the internet is discussed. The host and guests theorize that Dave's style of speaking became the default internet vernacular. While a bold claim, it's nowhere near unfounded and veers towards the highly plausible. At its height, Homestuck was an inescapable feature of the digital landscape, an immensely influential facet of fan culture that, even when not directly involved with, managed to slip itself into many people's experiences. I know multiple people who read through the entirety of Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff without realizing it was connected to Homestuck. Words like abscond and strife were put on the map by Homestuck's peculiar lexicon. The shape and style of Homestuck's prose is just one aspect of the work that has had a subtle but cascading effect on digital communication. Homestuck left its mark on the internet, but it never stopped being a conversation. The two-way nature of the narrative persisted, and it reflected its audience throughout its run. The twelve main trolls were based on archetypical denizens of the internet, defined first by aggression and elite speech before blossoming into more three-dimensional figures. Something that only happened because fans were relentless in their curiosity towards the trolls. Their formal introduction in Act 5's Hivebent coincided with a greater focus on character drama and relationships, adding new dimensionality to the story and, combined with the general bizarre intrigue of trolls, kicked off an explosion in popularity. With this increased prominence came a wider variety of fans, and an increase in the hardcore type of fans. Fan artists, shippers, fanfic writers, role players, the list goes on. In other words, the type of people Tumblr was known for. And that's exactly where the comic picked up traction. For a few years, Tumblr was practically synonymous with Homestuck. Whether or not you knew what Homestuck was, you couldn't scroll far without seeing those candy corn horns. Now, I'm not saying there weren't fans like this present from the beginning, just that there was a major shift in the fanbase following Hivebent, and the scale and manner in which people interacted with the work shifted quite a bit as a result. If you're online enough to have read or have any interest in Homestuck, then you probably already know about Tumblr and its legacy. But on the off chance you don't, what's important is that Tumblr is a blogging site that was known primarily for fandoms back in the 2010s. It was a site full of fangirling and fervor, a home for those who absolutely obsessed over the media they loved, but unlike many social and fandom spheres on the internet, Tumblr also had a prominent leaning towards social justice and surrounding issues. 
It was, and to some extent still is, the most left-leaning social space on the internet. And like much of the web in 2012, it was a home for people who felt like they didn't quite fit in. And so Tumblr not only had a user base full of giant nerds, but also queer folks. And just to be clear, once again, this isn't the first time Homestuck had queer fans, it's just when the queer fan base grew exponentially. Now, at this point, Homestuck had already matured and grown quite a bit. Its comedic stylings were still sardonic, but not quite as thoughtlessly irreverent as before. Act 5, as previously stated, put a lot more focus onto the relationships and emotions of its characters. This shift was a slow burn, with the lore and story evolving, the characters had to keep up. This new, relationship-oriented style was codified by the exploration of the ever-beloved troll romance system. And with it came the revelation that trolls, the new heavy hitters of the Homestuck canon, were bisexual by default. Or, as Carcat puts it, humans have a word for that? In an interview with the Washington Post, author Andrew Hussey was asked about the increase in queer characters as the comic went on. I didn't plan it, but was generally open to any kind of development for the characters. Again. That was the point, to let them grow with the story and discover who they really were, just like real kids do. But I think this feature of the story was definitely influenced by the fandom. The story has ways of reflecting the fandom back at itself in many respects. As things went along, I noticed there was an ever-growing LGBTQ portion of the fandom, which I wasn't really expecting to happen, but it seemed like a welcome development. If these were going to feel like real kids whose experiences of growing up resonated with real people reading this, it felt like a big portion of the readership should have their own experiences reflected in the thing they're reading. As the fandom changes, the comic changes, and vice versa. Homestuck is a piece of media made by its fandom as much as it made its fandom. The made of fandom, if you will. You know, uh, the best way I can explain this is with an allusion to Mass Effect, a very good video game series. Homestuck is a lot like the Geth, a prominent alien hive mind in the franchise. You can't really think of it as a singular entity because it's inherently collaborative by nature. The complexity of a given Geth is proportional to the individual Geth programs present in a system. Just one or two Geth hooked up to a server gives you a tin can with some basic functions. But as their numbers increase, so too does the depth of thought and emotion they're capable of. Homestuck, similarly, did not develop its heart and complexity by the author's hand alone. Rather, the steady growth of its fanbase provided thousands upon thousands of viewpoints and interactions with the comic. These were then folded back into the work, leading it to become a far more intricate and thoughtful piece of media. Now needless to say, for as much as I hype it up, this isn't some magical process. It wasn't a perfect mirror, and at times the author messed up. The Beforest trolls are bled from the same vein as the original Twelve, drawing on internet archetypes. This time, though, as a nod to Homestuck's popularity on Tumblr, the Dancestors were based on stereotypes of the site's, um, strangest denizens. This worked to varying degrees, with some being pretty fun, and others ending up downright disrespectful and gross. There were low points, mistakes, and failures, but there was also a fandom that demanded Homestuck do better when these things happened, and always believed that it could. The relationship that Homestuck had with its audience was so essential to its core that the fandom literally became a character, and the character responsible for driving the entire story, no less. It's no secret that Calliope and Caliborn are meant to embody the good and bad of the Homestuck fandom, respectively. Calliope makes fan art and writes fan fiction. She has a troll Sona and sees the characters as her friends, wishing desperately to self-insert herself into the narrative alongside them. Caliborn, on the other hand, is impatient and only values high-octane action and male characters. He constantly tears down Calliope's creations, devalues any part of the narrative he dislikes, and mercilessly harasses anyone he even slightly disagrees with. The cherubs are just incredibly on the nose. This is as blatant as it can get. Fanboys always wanted me to do more cool fight scenes and got grouchy when I didn't. It's one of the many reasons why so many fanboys of a certain ilk are completely terrible. Actually, in many ways, a great deal of the thematic focus of Homestuck as a piece of metafiction revolves around my contempt for certain kinds of fanboys. If you could boil down my relationship with the shitty fanboy archetype via Homestuck, all you really have to do is skip forward to the part in Act 6 where I'm talking to Caliborn through his giant computer and tormenting him by gluing his mouse to the desk, blaring loud music he can't mute, etc. That scene says it all about my ongoing relationship with these guys, and the manner in which I generally felt inclined to serve them. 
through my work. It's notable that the comic includes an entire plotline wherein the author interfaces with their own portrayal and interpretation of the worst parts of the fandom. In its own odd way, it gives a bit of insight to the struggle that goes into creating on the internet, something many can relate to on a smaller scale. While the entire dynamic between Caliborn and Hussey's self-insert could be blatantly self-serving and egotistical, it's handled in a way that makes it not just palatable, but entertaining and interesting as a piece of the main narrative and meta-narrative. The author's self-insert is literally killed by Lord English shortly before Caliborn and Calliope come into prominence. What's being symbolically communicated here is a relinquishment of control to the whims of the fans. While Homestuck proper was never literally turned over to the control of the fandom, the Cherubs are a confirmation of how important fandom was to shaping the story. As the Lord of Time and Muse of Space, respectively, Caliborn and Calliope are responsible for directly or indirectly driving everything that happens in Homestuck. As with the fandom, they are the beginning and the end, that which is integral to the story's continued existence. Such a forward and essential acknowledgement of fandom is unique to Homestuck. And it's a very intentional testament to the fan-author relationship that's driven the story from page one. Fan stand-ins in other works tend to be goofy at best and downright insulting at worst. Yet the cherubs are treated with care and respect. Well, Caliborn is absolutely excruciating and is tormented throughout the story, mostly by Hussey's self-insert, but he's still a developed, interesting, and vital piece of the narrative. He's not some one-off potshot at readers, more an exploration of the contentious and difficult relationship between creator and bad faith critic. Calliope, then, is an expression and celebration of the benevolence that rises from fandom. She literally cheers the alpha kids as they go on their quest, encouraging them to keep faith and not give up when circumstances look dire. Because this is the reader's third foray into Suburb, like Calliope, we share knowledge of what their future holds and feel excitement to see their game pan out in the same way that she does. At the same time, though, she faces judgment and abuse for her pure-hearted enjoyment of the narrative, something that can feel all too real sometimes. Even through turbulence, Calliope's story is still ultimately one of appreciation and joy. The happy ending Calliope receives, despite her suffering and the feeling she may not have earned it, is nothing if not an ultimate act of graciousness towards the Homestuck fandom. What Callie is meant to say is, thank you, I love you, this story loves you, and it wouldn't be here without you. Homestuck would not exist, or at least not exist in its full envelope-pushing multimedia glory, without its fandom. Homestuck was elevated and kept running because of fan contributions and the positive force generated by everyone who enjoyed the comic. It is a celebration of creativity and inspiration, a story not only about stories, but about the people who love them, the people who create fan art, fan fiction, roleplay, fan adventures, and every other project and creation under the sun. And I think I could go for a bit of fan art right now, so let's draw a Trollsona. At this point, you've made it through over 5,000 words of my rambling. Homestuck is a work that contains a lifetime's worth of content to talk about, theorize on, and dissect. In the process of writing this video alone, I've stumbled upon at least five different topics I want to explore in the future. But it's important to sometimes slow down, take a break, and have some fun. Everything can get to be a lot, the good, the bad, the interesting, so for just a minute, we're taking a breather. For your sake, but also for my own. Hey, did you know that we have a Patreon now? If you'd like, you can support us there. We put a lot of time and effort into these videos, uh, this one especially, so it would mean a lot. Anyway, your name is Sam, you are a scientist professionally, but you make YouTube videos in your spare time. You're known to enjoy art and playing electric guitar, but you're not all that great at either. You have a notable interest in fashion, which means your wardrobe is filled with outfits that are overly fancy and ostentatious. But you've also got a healthy collection of leather jackets and boots. Class spec analysis would place you as the Maid of Hope. There we go, Samat Joyce. Well, that was fun. Thank you for indulging me, and now let's get back to the show. Homestuck is a lot of things to a lot of people, be it a memory from their youth, a subject of analysis, a favored story, or a lifelong passion. 
It has an incredible ability to evoke emotions, both positive and negative, at its mere mention. Homestuck's ability to make you feel things is at the center of why people love it. As the comic goes on, its ability to convey poignant emotions and complex characters becomes its strongest trait, and people often find themselves moved in indescribable ways by the time the comic has concluded. Homestuck is a story about growing up, but the actual story grows up as well. It starts in a place of flippant, distant snark, but it ends so heartfelt and endlessly sincere that it can be frightening to confront. To read Homestuck is to witness the cultivation of empathy, to watch the genesis and maturation of people caring about and trying to do right by each other. They make mistakes, they hurt each other, they do things they can't take back, and sometimes they lose people for good. Life is challenging, growing up is difficult, and it never really ends. Homestuck explores this journey in a very candid and natural way, both intentionally and as a byproduct of its own form. The meandering, massive nature of the comic lends itself to the story it's trying to tell, but this also makes it a challenge to give a quick and dirty example of how it manages to be so impactful. The mere thought of the panel with Rose and Roxy sitting and hugging is enough to make me tear up, but I can't really explain why without exploring the 800,000 word run that entails Rose's character arc. Her start as a passive-aggressive child, her sorrow and grimdark rage at her mother's death, her desperate attempt to use substance abuse to better understand the parent she lost. Her tumultuous trek through the vast expanse of her own personal narrative flows as naturally as a river, each instance melting into the next like a snowflake in the spring. Rose's story unfolds so seamlessly that you barely recognize the distance you've traveled with her until you look back and see how far you've come. And it's not alone. There are so many journeys and arcs within Homestuck that come to carry so much emotion, that means so much to me, that I can't help but shed tears over them. Even now, well past finishing the comic, this story evokes such a profound reaction from me that I almost don't know how to handle it, and I know I'm not alone in that. Homestuck grows up, and by its end it is a deeply empathetic and introspective piece of media. The uncertain, winding path from beginning to end only enriched by the cultivation of these traits, allowing it proper time and breadth to weave complex characters and explore the depths of their tapestry. The strange detours and missteps along the way ultimately add to the profundity of it all. It's true to life in that way. Growing up is far from a linear path, it's complicated and confusing, often redundant, at times too slow, and at other moments way, way too fast. Once Homestuck is finally fully unraveled before you, and not a moment sooner, you realize what this has all been about from panel one. A quest for self-actualization, for the deep peace and fulfillment that can only truly be found in the recognition and acceptance of one's full being. It is at once a profoundly cosmic and spiritual idea, but also one as familiar, grounded, and human as the feeling of one hand held in another. The unification of the spiritual and the human, of breath and blood, is whispered to us as the ultimate self. Throughout this story, we've been asked to confront life and death, doom and hope. We've seen the characters we love succeed and learn, and we've seen them fail and let us down. It's been a path of comedy and tragedy, of mistakes untenable and unwritten, of timelines that branch into spirographs and universes that fade into void. Throughout it all, we're urged to consider people before anything else. We've met countless iterations of each character, and we've been asked to understand each as a unique permutation of a greater whole. What is there to learn from the John prematurely killed by Typhius? If he's truly inconsequential to the Alpha timeline, then why do we linger on him? Maybe the best way to answer this is by looking at one of the characters with the most alternate versions of themselves. Aradia, though often an understated presence in the narrative, is perhaps the closest out of any of the cast to attain this type of enlightenment. Throughout the story, Aradia goes through many physically different iterations of herself. She goes from girl to ghost to guide to gizmo to god. Even though these are all, in essence, the same person traversing a single timeline, we must remember that Homestuck functions by considering every iteration of a character a unique being. Its own individual, in a sense. Each is the culmination of a different array of experiences. Even when there is a great deal of overlap, Robot Aradia still has greater aggregate experience and life than Frog Sprite Aradia, therefore making her a unique individual. Consider the way this author's note refers to God Tier Aradia watching her own memory play out in a dream bubble. Aradia is considerately peeping on her own memory, or Aradia bots, actually. It is her memory, but it's also someone else's, as she's no longer this version of herself. She's become a different person. This idea is explored again and again. Characters meet and collide with various incarnations of themselves. These personal conflicts stretch across timeline, universe, and dream bubble, and contribute to no small amount of the story. So it's clearly important. 
We stand to gain a lot by comparing all versions of a character against each other, seeing how different pasts and futures have changed and shaped them. Slowly, we can begin to form a composite image, a dream board of what it means to be a Radia or Jade or anyone else, and we start to understand what all this greater self mumbo jumbo is all about. Oftentimes, when characters lose certain qualities that came to define them, there is this sense of liberation they seem to experience. They become a happier, more relieved, easier going version of themselves. When Aradia ditches a defining quality we came to know her by, being dead, she becomes a much happier and self-actualized Aradia. The concept of an ultimate self, which appears much later, probably has its roots way back to stuff like this, which got the ball rolling on the idea that a more complete or fulfilled self is one that becomes free from mortal limitations, or the idiosyncrasies which comprise a specific instance of one version of yourself. Hence, an ultimate self is an aggregate of someone's full potential. It's not just doing away with negative traits, but summing up all iterations of yourself, including ones without those traits, allowing you to move beyond them, or maybe more accurately, to view them as insignificant in the grand totality of what a person really is. The ultimate self is not the perfect and most best you out there. Rather, it's a warts and all expression of the fully realized soul. It's who you are in your alpha incarnation, as much as it is who you are in the doom timeline where you made every mistake. It might not really be something you can ever fully grasp, not so long as you keep growing and changing, which is something you absolutely should do. It's part of why Homestuck is a challenging narrative with big emotions and little moments. It's why the most important parts of the story aren't the big fight scenes or the cool windy powers. It's the exploration of who all these characters are. The most important part of Dave isn't that he wears shades and uses broken swords. It's that he's someone who is grappling with the abuse he faced in his past and his struggle to divorce himself from the toxic ideals he was brought up in. Karkat's arc isn't about becoming an epic blood warrior. It's about giving up the hyper-violence of Alternia and choosing to create and exist in a new social reality. Roxy's great not because she's an elite hacks or a babe. She's great because she cares so damn much for the people in her life and deserves to be cared about in return. Only through really reckoning with the emotions that spring forth from their lives and experiences and wrestling with their implications can any of the cast or any of the audience begin to understand what the ultimate self really is. There's a reason that the last thousand pages or so of the comic are almost in entirely devoted to conversation and catharsis. Anything less would be woefully unfit to conclude even a fraction of the narratives at play. The moments of immense impact and beautiful finality in Homestuck aren't flashy spectacle or the deaths of villains. They're smaller moments that speak to the hearts of the characters that have walked this 8,000 page road with us. What matters is a hug, a thank you, a kiss goodbye, a reunion. Homestuck is a work that explores a vast array of emotions throughout its run, and it seems intent on drawing just as many from its audience, both positive and negative. For all the joy and laughter, there is pain and annoyance. It is a challenging and provocative work, and it knows that, and chooses at times to intentionally lead the reader to frustration. This is where Homestuck offers a different sort of challenge to its audience. Rather than asking them to confront and grapple with difficult subject matter, the narrative often twists and begins toying with your patience and stamina. Like a true prankster with a trunk full of traps, Homestuck employs a variety of tactics in an attempt to make the reader drop the work before they can reach the previously described catharsis. This may take the form of inane, bloated nonsense, or meteoric drops in quality, or being denied satisfaction. This sort of clownery is ever-present and ever essential to the narrative. But to what end? What in the world does a piece of literature have to gain from being intentionally off-putting? There is a theatricality pervasive throughout Homestuck, a feeling of not only performance and the proper dressings, but of ancient tradition. As a work, it has often been compared to Grecian epic poetry. Defined thusly, there is little room for argument. An epic poem is a lengthy narrative poem, ordinarily involving a time beyond living memory, in which occurred the extraordinary doings of extraordinary men and women who, in dealings with the gods or other superhuman forces, gave shape to the mortal universe for their descendants. Examination of Homestuck in the post-completion era has often led to its framing as a creation myth. And really, I have to thank known Homestuck genius Optimistic Duelist for enlightening me to this idea. Theater finds its roots within worship and myth, beginning with the Greeks as a tool of education on sacred matters. In time, it developed into an art and birthed tragedy and comedy. 
Homestuck is nothing if not an extravagant buffet of comedy and tragedy in equal measure. The humor in Homestuck often reaches outside the bounds of canon, straying beyond the home of the comic and planting itself into other sections of the internet. If the comedy is three-dimensional, then so too must be the tragedy. A normal work of this ilk would be satisfied in evoking sorrow and tears, but Homestuck would prefer, at times, to make us the tragedy, to frustrate and humiliate us as we read. It actively attempts to provoke rage, and in a strange way, as it does so, it wraps back around to comedy. In retrospect, the deaths become funny. We can only laugh at our past selves for the torturous frustration we felt over Caliborn's terrible drawings, or all the little fractures and logic brought about by clowns. It's all quite silly when you think about it. This sort of muddled, confusing emotional range is part of what makes Homestuck such an endlessly fascinating piece of fiction. Homestuck is awe, a shiver running down your spine, and the hairs on the back of your neck standing up on end while a smile beams on your face. It's slumping down in your chair and pulling out your hair in agony. It's a deep inhale through your nose and the feeling of a breath hitching in your chest. The empathy Homestuck has cultivated over the course of its run is what makes it so poignant. That same empathy, mixed with the community-influenced nature of the work, are what made Homestuck an undeniably queer piece of art by its end. And an extremely important one at that. It is legitimately difficult to express in any succinct manner how incredibly queer Homestuck is, and how important it was to have a work like that in the early 2010s internet. I feel like maybe this goes without saying, but America may be pretty progressive when compared to the rest of the world, but gay marriage was only legalized in 2015, and queer phobia is still deeply ingrained within our society. Nowhere is that fact more visible than on the internet. And yet, here's Homestuck, this work that grabbed the web by its throat and shook things up so thoroughly that it permanently changed internet culture. And it's just so unabashedly gay. There's Rosemary, Dave Petta, Dirk Jake, literally all the trolls, and Dave, the king of popularity polls, has a whole arc about coming to comfort with his own bisexuality. The list is so long that if you asked me to name a Homestuck character that I was 100% sure was straight and cis, I don't think I'd be able to. It's not just the representation, though. Homestuck doesn't slip in a, by the way, this character is a lesbian, and call it a day. No, it explores these characters, their relationships, their feelings, and it does so thoughtfully and organically. Kanai and Rose aren't magically in love one day. Their relationship develops over time, and continues to develop after they officially get together. They have highs and lows just like anyone else would. Homestuck does it, and it does it well. I think about the interactions between Callie and Roxy, a couple that isn't even explicitly canon, and I cry. Yeah, I'm in possession of an overly sensitive heart, but by its conclusion, Homestuck is a work dedicated to and fueled by love. Love for the self and love for others, be it romantic, familial, platonic, red, black, pale, and rainbow. Homestuck is still the biggest piece of independent media to ever enthrall the internet. Nothing has ever been as widespread and all-encompassing as it was. Nothing truly compares. The internet has always been a queer space, a realm where like-minded people can connect and carve out their own communities. It feels right that an internet-defining work would become so linked with queer community. The Perfectly Generic Podcast's 2019 community survey for Homestuck showed that the largest demographic of fans were bisexuals, making up 34.4% of the respondents. Further, a whopping 57.1 of respondents answered yes when asked if Homestuck, related media, or the community had affected their relationship with gender and sexuality. 57%! Now, I'm a scientist. I do have to take into consideration that these are topics often discussed on the podcast hosting the survey, so listeners are more likely to be interested there. But nonetheless, this says a lot about how people engage with and continue to engage with Homestuck as a property. By the end of the story, Homestuck is nothing less than queer art. And that's important. The love that fans showed Homestuck melded the story into its ultimate form, one of compassion, hope, and effort. It went from uncaring and ironic to deeply passionate and earnest. Homestuck ended as a work that courageously bore its heart to the world, one that believed in trust and empathy and kindness. It's a deeply moving read. What else can I say? You know, halfway through writing this video, my feelings sort of changed a bit. When I re-entered the Homestuck fandom, I was extremely nervous, to put it lightly. Practically since its creation, Homestuck has had a stigma attached. It's been treated as a cursed property. Homestuck is not welcome, and people will go to great lengths to make this known. I had good, kind friends react with an ugh, Homestuck, in a feigned display of disgust when I told them I'd been reading it. When pressed, they admitted they didn't even care or know much about it. That was just the trained response, an impulse that had been ingrained in them by years on the internet. 
even through joyful rediscovery that quickly melted into warm, intense love for the comic, I was always afraid to talk about it, afraid to share this strong passion I had. I usually love introducing my friends to new media, streaming my current game of choice to a small discord of friends, or arranging movie nights. Sharing the things I love with the people I love is my lifeblood. It's the greatest jubilation I can fathom. But with Homestuck, it always felt guilty. I felt dirty and wrong for delighting so purely in this webcomic. I would hang out with friends and warn them, I'm gonna say a little something about Homestuck now, but feel free to tell me to shut up. I remember telling Kyle, my best friend and the person I run this nerdy, self-indulgent channel with, that I could keep quiet about Homestuck if he didn't want to hear about it. And I said these things unprompted, just because this fear and humiliation had been ground so deep into me. I've come a long way in the decades since I first read Homestuck. I'm a fully functioning, thriving adult. I'm a professional, published researcher and scientist. I'm a proud bisexual who loves painting and crafting and hanging out with the wonderful, amazing friends that I love so much. But all it took was a few insincere words and a deep, aching fear to make me feel like I was a scared kid again. A kid who was so lonely and already so hurt by the world in ways she couldn't even comprehend. A kid who found solace in the internet and loved a silly little webcomic and the community that sprung up around it. I wish I could say, I don't know how she forgot that that community saved her life and put her on the road to a brighter future. But I do. I know how she forgot. It was shame. A shame that mirrors what I feel today when I think about how I submitted to cruelty, abandoned something I loved, and buckled to a crowd of cutting tongues that convinced me I had to turn my back on my passion. I've been gone a long time. It's been five years since the comic ended, and almost a decade since Homestuck was at its peak of popularity. It would take months of research to get a reasonable profile of the comic's fall from the heights and the slow dispersal of its fandom. The Homestuck fandom's legacy is one so immensely deep and layered that I don't think I'm in any place to recount it all. I can only ever view these events as an outsider. My feet weren't on the ground when the comic wrapped or when the epilogues dropped, so I can't give you a reliable perspective on how that felt. Immersing myself in the fandom may enrich my understanding of its history, but unless I become a hard-boiled detective and interview myriad fans for their takes on the milestones within this comic's sprawling past, I cannot give you a reliable account. But I'm not really interested in that anyway. I can't stand drama videos, and I'm not trying to milk money and views out of a sloppy recap of the hot Homestuck discourse. That would be kind of a shitty thing to do. There are a lot of tall tales out there about what happened to the Homestuck fandom. Dramatic diatribes on never-ending discourse and scandalous stories about scams. But I'm starting to understand that most of these yarns are really just hyperbolized products of a rumor mill that sees Homestuck and the people who enjoy it as oddities to be gawked at. It's true that the road has been bumpy, and there have been some severe mistakes. And yeah, there's a lot of discourse. But when something is defined by its worst aspects and people prime themselves to interpret gossip in only the most sensationalized way for the sake of tabloid-esque entertainment, truth, nuance, and reality are lost. What happened to the Homestuck fandom is a far more boring story than a lot of people would like it to be. People lost interest during the pauses. The comic ended. The continuations weren't to people's likings. That covers a lot of it, but I don't want to act like there weren't toxic elements at play. When I look back at the decade between my past and current involvement with this fandom, I see scars that stretch deep. The comic became incredibly queer, and that drew a lot of harassment. The story I never seem to hear discussed by those looking in from the outside is the one of queer fans and creators facing catastrophic levels of bigoted vitriol. I'm not gonna linger, but I think it's important to acknowledge that. Through it all, though, it's kinda weird to me that people talk about the Homestuck fandom like it's dead. I've been in some truly dead fandoms, and that's very much not what this is. Maybe the community was just so astronomical at its height that anything less will feel tiny. The comic itself may have ended, but Homestuck is still very much alive. Homestuck has basically become its own extended universe. It was never just the comic, if you think about it. Paradox Space and Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff existed outside the work during its run, and they were just the beginning. A few years after the comic wrapped, the meat and candy epilogues dropped. While contentious among fans, they embodied a continued maturation of the story and meditated on highly relevant issues of power and culture. The epilogues were meant to bridge into the equally contentious Homestuck 2 Beyond Canon, which ran for a time before going on indefinite hiatus. Even if the reception to both was mixed, 
there are still people that deeply love these works and get a lot out of them. They're far from perfect, but they're semi-canon for a reason. You can choose whether to accept them or throw them out in favor of your own interpretations. There's much more than a single timeline and a handful of characters to follow, though. Homestuck is a vast universe rich in lore and untapped potential. The video game additions to the series draw from the well of possibility that is Alternia with Hiveswap and its side game, Friendsim. Not only do they add an immense amount of coveted troll and class spec to lore to the series, but they're absolute joys to play. Hiveswap Acts 1 and 2 have quickly become favorites of mine, and I can barely wait until the third act and Haunt Switch come out. I love Hiveswap so much that in the middle of writing this video, I made a Joey Claire cosplay. Actually, you know what? Hiveswap is so good that I'll give the first three people who haven't played it but want to download codes for Act 1. Just comment that you want to play it and I'll hand out a code if I still have them. Go nuts! Friendsim was such a smash hit that it even received a sequel in Pest Request, another visual novel-style game that featured the core cast of Homestuck. Quite a welcome addition considering that even after 800,000 words of the comic proper, people still wanted to see more of their favorite characters. But the semi-canon continuations aren't really what fill me with hope and light when I think about Homestuck's future. I'm personally of the belief that every story has to end at some point. Endings are what give a narrative meaning and closure, after all. It's probably obvious what I'm gonna say by now. It's the fans. Everyone who loves and has ever loved Homestuck is the reason this story lives on. Every day, I am absolutely gobsmacked at the depths of creativity and creation this fandom is capable of. There's such a tangible passion that pervades these fan spaces, with hundreds and thousands of fans still actively drawing fan art, writing fan fiction, composing, cosplaying, coding, and I'm in awe. Every time you feel inspired and then pour that inspiration into a creation of your own, you breathe new life into Homestuck and its universe. The fans are the players, and the extended universe is the world we created. So much has blossomed within fan spaces. Vast Error, a fan adventure starred in 2013, is an ongoing comic that takes many of the basic premises and systems of Homestuck and remixes them into something unique and fascinating. Friendsim and PesterQuest's visual novel style spawned a plethora of fan projects of a similar ilk focusing on minor characters like the Dancestors and Ancestors. Vast Error even has its own version of these, with Snowbound Blood. Even though the official Homestuck albums have long since wrapped with the comic, the melodic legacy of Homestuck still persists. It's inspired myriad fan albums. Many of these collections are organized by an unofficial fan band camp that had its latest release, Friend Symphony, as recently as November 2020. It's not even just purely Homestuck-related content, either. The comic had such a profound effect on the internet that it's no surprise that myriad properties have continued to carry the torch and champion the ideas that Homestuck came to represent by its end. Undertale is the biggest example by far, mechanically desiring to break down the confines of genre and medium, but also resembling Homestuck in its intense heart and sincerity. It should come as no surprise, seeing as Toby Fox was a big part of the Homestuck team, and the support that garnered him helped to fund Undertale in the first place. More recently, we have Blaseball, which on its own is just a numbers game, but the fandom it attracted has breathed life and lore into its universe and characters. The resemblance to Homestuck's relationship with its fandom is far from a unique take. It's common knowledge. Also, Optimistic Duelist says Kill Six Billion Demons is a distinctly post-Homestuck work, and I'm gonna take their word on that. The body of work that persists and continues into the current day is absolutely breathtaking. Trying to take it all in is like trying to count all the stars in the sky. The amount of creation inspired by Homestuck is inadequately described as cosmic in scale. Like the universe itself, Homestuck as a theme or a medium or a muse is ever-expanding, and it's because of the fans that love it. Despite years of uphill battle and more than a few setbacks, there's still so much delight here. It's genuinely incredible and... I guess I'm just feeling way inspired by the fact everyone is here together, and we're all about to try and do something huge and important. Nothing can really be 2013 Homestuck ever again, but it's still here, and it's still so full of passion. And really, I think there's a lot of value in looking at how far we've come after all this time. Nothing stays the same forever, and this fandom isn't immune to that rule. Its current iteration is unique from what it was a year ago, or what it was a decade ago. Even though that means losing aspects of what the fandom once was, it also means gaining new ones. Things have changed, for better or worse, but there's still a lot to enjoy, and a lot of people enjoying it. All the creativity and love is just... so wonderful to see. 
It makes me want to give my all to it. To cheer for every single artist, to write fix, to even pick up a pencil and make some sloppy drawings, though that's not my forte. I made this video because I can't keep quiet. I can't not talk about this amazing, incredible, one-of-a-kind thing. This has always been Homestuck's greatest power. It is a muse. It gives us a space, a universe of possibility, of ideas and imagination. Then it asks us to help fill it. It was like this as a comic, and it's the same way as a fandom. A vision reflected and redesigned by countless minds with countless brushes, keys, and colors. Homestuck was never the work of a single person. It was a collaboration from the first time someone typed a command. Ever since, it's only grown. The palettes are bright, the mediums are many, the love is immeasurable. Homestuck is an embodiment of the promise of the internet and the potential of fandom. At its best, it is the culmination of thousands of hearts, the human passion for stories. That fire doesn't die when one comic ends. It persists, and it seeks what's next. I know it can be hard to live on the other side of a work's golden age, but if you ever need some kindling, just look around you. The works that exist inside the Homestuck universe are never-ending. There's more than could ever be read in existence. And as time goes on, that legacy is only expanded by the zeal of fans who still feel for this work. Look up and see that this fandom has already painted their own galaxy and hung countless stars in the sky to guide you. Then, pick up a pen, a pencil, a keyboard, or a clothespin, and hang a new star yourself. That's the interesting and wonderful thing about creations. The original content is only the basic architecture. As the foundation ages, moss grows, ivy crawls down the walls. As your memories, your experiences around the work grow, so does its color, its shape, its meaning. Homestuck is an endlessly fascinating piece of art. I think I can safely say that to anyone who's made it this far. There are so many things to talk about. How it's written, its use of multimedia, its fascinating lore, the exquisite character work. There's still even more to say on the way fans influenced it. But like I said before, everything has to end at some point. I'm wondering now if I was able to get my point across in this behemoth. Or does a retrospective really need a thesis outside of reflecting on a piece of media? It's hard to say. How many words does it take to convey love, or the raw depths of emotion that art can make you feel? My best guess would be somewhere in the realm of 13,000 words. The thing they don't tell you in YouTuber school is that writing is really, really hard. And yet, writing about Homestuck is somehow easier. It feels natural, and it's a work that makes you want to gush about it. It would be a remarkable challenge to describe the rain to someone who's lived their whole life in the desert, yet the cozy reflection of eventide lights on droplet-speckled window panes makes you want to try anyway. Trying to make people understand what's so special about this big, silly comic is kind of like that. Yet, even if I look like a total fool, even if no one understands, I'm gonna keep trying. Homestuck is a piece of art that deserves to be known. Like anything else, it has numerous flaws and it may at times be challenging to engage with. But it's an important cultural touchstone in a lot of ways. Beyond that, it's just a really good story and I like it. My understanding of Homestuck is incomplete, but I think everyone's is. Uh, that statement is letting me off the hook a little too much, so let's say that my understanding of Homestuck is a lot more incomplete than other people's. But that lack of full comprehension, the blank space and the myriad questions Homestuck leaves us with, is the point. It provokes thought and invites creation. It's a work that enraptured and captured the internet. It grew over its run and became a sincere and heartfelt piece of art. As time goes on, the universe it created is given more and more to the fans that supported and loved it along the way. There is nothing else truly like Homestuck. It is unabashedly goofy, it is endlessly tragic yet merciful, it is a crucible of length and clownery, it is sweet and kind and queer, it is anime swords and science fiction and mythology, it is so many things, and it is the best piece of fiction I have ever had the pleasure of reading. So this is an ending, but it's also a beginning. I'm inspired, I want to create more, and I know I will. I've come back to being able to embrace something that I loved so much. And like I said, there's still so much more to talk about. I can only hope that maybe this will be a beginning for some others too. Maybe I've been able to convince people that this work is worth their time, or that it's worth returning to. Or maybe I've just given you some food for thought. That's all I can hope for. 
So I guess today is finally the day you make everything better. It is the day where after the legendary octet of mutual progenitoriety, we'll come together and heal a great breach in paradox space. A day delivered through 80 billion years and four distinct universal instances worth of unfathomable turbulence. And while the emerald eye of the storm is fixed in the abyss forever, today you are poised to escape its scowl once and for all. By Skya's guiding light, you may leave behind its turning arms of bright colors and mayhem, and secure peace for your cosmic progeny for all duration. And if you are to meet this departure with trepidation, I would understand. But I would also ask, is there nothing I can do to ease your mind? I wrote 13,000 words on Homestuck, and I didn't mention Riska once. Thank you so much for watching this video. It was a labor of love to create, and I'm happy someone found it worthwhile enough to see through to the end. Shout out to the co-host of this channel, Kyle, for help with voice work and editing. This video would have taken a lot longer to produce without him. And a big thank you to Optimistic Duelist for their help with script review and for lending their voice, knowledge, and visual assets to this production. If you haven't already, you should definitely go check out their channel and writings. They make some of the best analytical content out there for Homestuck. All the videos, creators, and articles referenced are linked below, alongside other sources that went into the making and research for this video. If you liked what you saw, why not like, subscribe, and leave a comment while you're at it? It helps out the channel a lot, and we always appreciate hearing from you, even if you're just telling us who your favorite troll is. We also have a brand new Patreon, where you can find the script notes for this video, as well as other content, including our first seasonal talkback, which will be coming out next week, and will include notes about this video. By becoming a patron, you also gain access to our comfy, cozy community Discord. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end. I put my heart into this video, and I'm so glad you listened. Have a wonderful day.